you know, Brooklyn's got the best crowd. Hilton, welcome. We've all been stuck in rallies and not being able to get through, and I have to say, um, I'd rather be stuck in a, a rally protesting for peace all around the city than Christmas shopping in Midtown. Good afternoon and welcome to the Brooklyn Museum. My name is Ann Pasternak and I always say I'm the lucky gal who gets to serve this wonderful institution. Joining me on the stage today are American Sign Language interpreters, Andrea Alefi and Maria Cardoza. Thank you, please join us. And as we begin our time together, let's have a moment. Oh, you're right here next to me. Hi. <laughs> as we begin our time together, let's have a, a moment of quiet reflection, a moment to pray for peace and love for people around the world, and a moment to recognize we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. As a sign of respect, we recognize and honor the Lenape Delaware nations their elders past and present, and future generations. Thank you. Over the past several years, the Brooklyn Museum team has been thrilled to collaborate with the acclaimed writer, curator, and educator, Hilton Knowles, to bring to fruition the publication, God Made My Face, a collective portrait of James Baldwin. Hilton's exemplary work has lo long looked deeply into art as a way to grapple with the impacts of structural oppression. It is an honor to welcome him back to our stage, especially as James Baldwin stood here decades ago to call for an end to lynchings in the United States. Now I'm just curious, did any of you see Hilton's profoundly moving exhibition on James Baldwin at David Zwerner Gallery back in 2019? Let's raise our hands. I might get the record, I saw it no less than three times. So I was thrilled when Hilton and the president of the Ford Foundation, the wonderful Darren Walker, called me one day during COVID and asked if we'd be interested in working together on a book and the symposia. Guess what my answer was? Hell yes. We are indebted to Hilton, the Ford Foundation, my public programs and publications teams, the writers of this publication, today's presenters, uh, for all, everyone's brilliant work in exploring the profound legacy of James Baldwin. Now our symposia will start out with an opening invocation of, by Brooklyn-based writer Jacqueline Woodson, followed by two con conversations focusing on Baldwin's legacy in literature and visual art. And afterward, we're going to break for reception in the Beaux-Arts Court, and I hope you will join us for the culminating performance the Gospel of James Baldwin by the truly incredible Michelle Ndigay Ocello. I always bastardized that, thank you. Now, without further ado, it is my joy to introduce our first speaker, Jacqueline Woodson. Wait a second, I'm not ready yet. She is the author, I'm sure you all know this, of more than 30 books for young people and adults, including Another Brooklyn, Red at the Bone, and The Day You Begin. She has received so many awards, a 2023 Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, a 2023 B. White Award, a 2020 MacArthur Fellowship Genius Award, the 2020 Hans Christian Andersen Award, the 2018 Astrid Lingden Memorial Award, and the 2018 Children's Literature Legacy Award, to name just a few. Her New York Times bestselling memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming, won the National Book Award, the Coretta Scott King Award, a Newbery Honor, and the NAACP Image Award. Her books for young readers have been similarly awarded the globally and globally praised. In 2018, she founded Baldwin for the Arts, a residency serving writers and composers, interdisciplinary and visual artists of the global majority. She lives in Brooklyn, New York with her family. And we are honored to have her on our stage today. Please give a big Brooklyn welcome to Jacqueline.
Thank you. Thanks for being here. I'm so glad you got here, Hilton. You are so deeply adored. Um, and thanks to the Brooklyn Museum, and thanks to all of you for coming out on this lovely, lovely day. And thanks to the people outside who are <sighs> helping us to move toward peace. Um, I am, I was asked to do an invocation, and then I had to practice the pronunciation of that word, because um, it's hard on the tongue. And then I had to figure out exactly what it was, and then, and I was asked to read from some of my work. So I am starting by reading from Another Brooklyn, which is a novel, and its title pays homage to James Baldwin's Another Country, and Betty Smith's A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. That year, every song was telling some part of our story. We crowded around the small radio in Sylvia's room and listened. When Gigi's mother wasn't home, we went there after school, waited while Gigi used the key that hung from around her neck to unlock the door. There was no couch in the one-room apartment, so we sat on the floor around her close-and-play record player, the volume turned down low. We leaned in to listen as Al Green begged us to lay our heads upon his pillow, and Tavares asked us to please remember what they told us to forget. And Minnie Ripperton and Sylvia hit notes so high and long, it felt like the world was ending. The world was ending. We had been girls wobbling around the apartment in Gigi's mother's go-go boots, and then, and then, and then. Little pieces of Brooklyn began to fall away, revealing us. We envied each other's hair, eyes, butts, noses. We traded clothes and shared sandwiches. Some days we laughed until soda sprayed from our noses and hiccups erupted in our chest. When boys called our names, we said, don't even say my name. Don't even put it in your mouth. When they said, you ugly anyway, we knew they were lying. When they hollered, conceited, we said, no, convinced. <laughs> we watched them dip walk away, too young to know how to respond. The four of us together weren't something they understood. They understood girls alone, fo folding their arms across their breast, praying for invisibility. At eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, we knew we were being watched. We tried to hold on. We played double dutch and jacks. We chased the ice cream truck down the block, waving our change-filled fist. We frog jumped over tree stumps, pulled each other into gushing fire hydrants, learned to dance the loose booty to sly in the family stone, hustled to Van McCoy. We brought t-shirts with our names and our zodiac signs and iron-on letters. We pretended to believe we could unlock arms and walk the streets al alone, but we knew we were lying. I and I and I and I, we chanted. We and we and we and we. We hand song, down, down, baby, down by the roller coaster, sweet, sweet baby, I'ma never let you go. Because we wanted to believe we were years and years away from sweet, sweet babies. We wanted to believe we would always be connected this way. Sylvia, Angela, Gigi, and I had moved far past my longest fingernail, all the way up my arm. Years had passed since my mother, I'd heard my mother's voice. When she showed up again, I'd introduce her to my friends. I'd say, you were wrong, Mama. Look at us hugging. Look at us laughing. Look at how we begin and end each other. Thank you. In the creative process, Baldwin wrote, the role of the artist is exactly the same as the role of the lover. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. As writers, as artists, as activists, this is the work we have been brought here to do. Make the world conscious of what it doesn't, is too afraid, or simply refuses to see. When I created Baldwin for the Arts, it was to do exactly this, to make artists conscious of their brilliance in a world that often disregards it, and by extension, to give the artists a platform by which to first create and then shine. I called on our ancestor, James Baldwin, then, 
and I call on him today. I know that as a writer, I am here because of the writers who came before me. I know that I am not alone in calling on our ancestors. Because Baldwin has in some way touched every single one of us in this space. So let us bring him here to see the gleaming. As we move toward the centennial of his birth, let us go through today once again being reminded of the many ways in which he side-eyed the world's audacity to try to render him invisible. Let us bring all the queer ancestors into the room to show them that we are here in collective creation because of them. To all the folks who gathered at smoky juke joints and Harlem parties and literary salons where they saw their people and their people saw them, come by here. Baldwin and Hansberry and Hughes and Lord and Hempful and Saint and Beam and the others, think their names, say their names, bring them into the room and welcome them home. Come by here, Ashe. Let's hear it again for Jacqueline Woodson. Thank you for the beautiful opening for our symposium. And good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. My name is Margot, and I'm a, I'm a, I am the manager of public programs here at the Brooklyn Museum. It has been an absolute honor to collaborate with Hilton in dreaming up this celebration for the past two years and we're so glad that the day is finally here. Without further ado, it is a joy to introduce the participants in our first conversation, Sex in the City, James Baldwin and the Politics of Queer Life. Hilton Alls became a staff writer at The New Yorker in 1994 and a theater critic in 2002. In 2017, he won the Pulitzer Prize for criticism for his work. His book, White Girls, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the winner of the 2014 Lambda Literary Award. His latest book is titled My Pinup. Alls is a teaching professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and an associate professor of writing at Columbia University School of the Arts. Stephen Best is the Rachel Anderson Stageberg Professor of English and the Director of the Townsend Center for the Humanities at the University of California, Berkeley. He is a scholar of American and African American literature and culture, and his books include None Like Us, Blackness, Belonging, Aesthetic Life, and The Fugitive's Properties, Law and the Poetics of Possession. Daphne A. Brooks is the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of African American Studies, American Studies, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Music at Yale University. She's the author of Bodies and Descent, Spectacular Performances of Race and Freedom in 1850 to 1910, Jeff Buckley's Grace, and Liner Notes for the Revolution, The Intellectual Life of Black Feminist Sound. She has published numerous liner notes, essays, and articles on black popular music culture, and her writing has appeared in The Nation, in The New York Times, on Pitchfork.com, among many other outlets. Last and certainly not least, John Keane is the author, co-author, and translator of numerous books, including Counter Narratives, Stories and Novellas, which received an American Book Award, a Lannan Literary Award, a Republic of Consciousness Prize, and a Wyndham Campbell Prize for Fiction. His most recent publication, Punks, New and Selected Poems, received the 2022 National Book Award for Poetry, the 2022 Tom Gunn Award from the Publishing Triangle, and a 2022 Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry, the 2018 MacArthur Fellow. He is a distinguished professor and serves as a department chair at Rutgers University in New York. Please help me in welcoming Hilton Alls, Daphne A. Brooke, Stephen Best, and John King to the stage.
what an entrance. Um, sorry my back is to you. Just for pack, unpacking my school bag, um, because with these distinguished panelists, you have to be prepared or be ashamed. Uh, um, I wanted to say a few words um, before we be began today. And one of them has to do with uh, gratitude. I'm very grateful to all of you for coming from far and wide to be with us today and to create really, I think, a space of intimacy. Um, there has to be some great, great acknowledgement to Ann Pasternak and Darren Walker. <clears throat> um, for creating an atmosphere um, in which critical inquiry um, can exist. Um, and I want to thank Margo, too, for shepherding some pretty wild minds, um, which don't always, zoom, don't, don't always um, jive with Zoom times and other things that we're supposed to pay attention to. Margo, you are a warrior. Um, I want to say, too, that we live in strange and then stranger times, but one of the great gifts that comes with being humane, thoughtful people is that we get to engage in emotional and intellectual inquiry in this free space of our hearts, um, whatever we say we are. Um, it is the work of being human that puts us on this stage today, celebrating, questioning, and engaging with this phenomenal artist and humanist, James Baldwin. Um, and I thought I would begin this afternoon um, because he was such a singularly autobiographical writer, I've asked each of the panelists to choose um, a paragraph of Baldwin's work that resonated for them uh, emotionally, critically, and autobiographically. Um, that's, that was pre-planned. The rest won't be pre-planned. Um, so I thought that we would start to my left, which is the estimable Stephen Best. Um, who has written um, in the catalog that you will buy um, <laughs> uh, a, a fantastic essay on Baldwin, language, and sound. It's really quite an extraordinary piece of work. So, Stephen, tell, tell us which paragraph okay. resonated for you. Um, so, I, uh, I, I, as I explained uh, when we did make our Zoom call, um, <laughs> uh, I... I was introduced to Baldwin as an undergraduate, and um, I, I, I'm not going to read from Notes of a Native Son, but this is the copy of Notes of a Native Son that I purchased when I was 18, wow. or however. Um, uh, I think I was around 18. We'll get back to that. I, but I decided not to read from Notes of a Native Son, but rather um, a friend of mine, Bonnie Honig, who is, I believe, in the audience, reminded me of a passage from um, The Devil Finds Work, which mm. Baldwin published in 76, I believe. That's right. And I thought it would be appropriate to kind of read this passage, given the volume, the title of the volume, God Made My Face, it, because it's a, one of the first passages I encountered where Baldwin is actually talking about his face. Yes. Um, so I thought I would read that. Please. Okay. My father said during all the years I lived with him that I was the ugliest boy he had ever seen, and I, and I had absolutely no reason to doubt him. But it was not my father's hatred of my frog eyes which hurt me, this hatred proving in time to be rather more resounding than real. I have my mother's eyes. When my father called me ugly, he was not attacking me so much as he was attacking my mother. No doubt he was also attacking my real and unknown father. And I loved my mother. I knew that she loved me, and I sensed that she was paying an enormous price for me. I was a boy, and so I didn't, real, I didn't really too much care that my father thought me hideous. So I said to myself, this judgment nevertheless was to have a decidedly terrifying effect on my life. But I thought that he must have been stricken blind, or was it as mysteriously wicked as white people, a paralyzing thought, if he was unable to see that my mother was absolutely beyond any question the most beautiful woman in the world. 
so here now was Betty Davis <laughs> on that Saturday afternoon in close-up over a champagne glass, Popeyes popping. I was astounded. I caught my father not in a lie but in an infirmity, for here before me, after all, was a movie star, white, and if she was white and a movie star, she was rich and she was ugly. I felt exactly the same way I felt just before this moment or just after when I was in the street playing and I saw an old, very black and very drunk woman stumbling up the sidewalk and I ran upstairs to my mother, to my mother, come to the window and see what I had found. You see, you see, she's uglier than you, mama. She's uglier than me. Wow. Last paragraph. I had not heard Bessie Smith's He's looking at the uh, um, uh, uh, Betty Davis in um, um, of human blondes uh, uh, in um, Sing Sing. Uh, two th Twenty thousand years in Sing Sing. Twenty thousand years in Sing Sing. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you. I had not yet heard Bessie Smith's "Why They Call the, This Place the Sing Sing." Come stand here by this rock pile and listen to these hammers ring. And it would be seven years before I would begin working on the railroad. It, it was to take a longer time than that before I would cry, a longer time than that before I would cry in anyone's arms, and a long, 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 long time before I would begin to realize what I myself was doing with my enormous eyes, or vice versa. This had nothing to do with Davis, the actress, or with all those hang-ups I didn't yet know I had. I had discovered that my infirmity might not be my doom, my infirmity or infirmities might be forged into weapons. Thank you. I have so much to say about that. <laughs> I think that what we'll do is we'll have each of the readings and then we'll convene after, I'll, I'll remember okay. um, what, the, what the passages were. Daphne, ladies in the middle. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I know we're being improvisational, yeah. but as a school teacher's child, I have to say, first, thank you. Hilton Alves for the invitation to participate in this project. And thank you, thank you. No, 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 thank you, Hilton. Yes. And oh. the opportunity to sit here in the round with my genius colleagues. Thank you, Hilton, for your worlding, fearless, ravishing and formidable arts criticism that demands our sharp engagement, our felt attention, and our willingness to continuously wrestle with the ways that art and culture have the potential to make or unmake us every single day. So thank you so much, Hilton. Thank you. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. So um, Steve and I didn't plan this, but we both went for the semi-obscure Baldwin, which is always fun. Um, I also chose Double Fine's um, work from 76. And one of the things that um, I just wanted to say about the passage that I'm gonna read is that, um, we know, of course, that Baldwin, he possessed a deep interest in film throughout his career. And two of my favorite essays by him are on Catfish Row, on the 1959 film adaptation of Corgi and Bess, and Carmen Jones' The Dark is Light Enough, which showcases unparalleled ability to dissect and illuminate the ways in which culture, and especially cinematic culture, operates as an intimate and yet distressingly potent arm of socio-political and psychic domination of the dispossessed. And I think about Baldwin's meditations on cultural power, cultural violence, cultural erasure, the moral failures of culture to expose the shibboleths of American democracy quite a bit these days in the year of our Lord God 2023, um, a year that some most media outlets would have us to believe um, is one in which a single ubiquitous culture maker in particular is the person of the year, for instance, and what that phenomenon tells us about cultural power, cultural violence, cultural erasure, cultural amnesia, just a few years beyond our so-called moment um, for it was indeed just a moment of racial reckoning in 2020. So here's the passage at the end of Devil Fine's work, which I think pairs really nicely with the beginning. If Lady Sings the Blues pretended to be concerned with the trials of a white girl and starred, say, the late Susan Hayward, I'll Cry Tomorrow, or Betty Davis, A Stolen Life, or Olivia de Havilland, To Each His Own, or the late Judy Garland, A Star is Born, or any of the current chicks, Billy's love for her father and for the husband who so turned her on would be the film's entire motivation. 
the guy that won you has run off and undone you, that great beginning has seen in its final inning as desperately falsified, but in quite another way. The situations of Lana Turner in The Postman Always Rings Twice, or Barbara Stanwyck in Double Indemnity, or Joan Crawford in almost anything, but especially Mildred Pierce, are dictated at bottom by the brutally crass and commercial terms on which the heroine is to survive, are dictated, that is, by society. But at the same time, the white chick is always somehow saved or strengthened or destroyed by love. Society is out of it, beneath her. It matters not at all that the man she marries or deserts or murders happens to own Rhodesia or that she does. Love is all. But the private life of a black woman, to say nothing of the private life of a black man, cannot really be considered at all. To consider this forbidden privacy is to violate white privacy by destroying the white dream of the blacks. To make black privacy a black and private matter makes white privacy real for the first time, which is indeed and with a vengeance to endanger the stewardship of Rhodesia. The situation of the white heroine must never violate the white self-image. Her situation must always transcend the inexorability of the social setting so that her innocence may be preserved. Grace Kelly, when she shoots to kill at the end of high noon, for example, does not become a murderess. But the situation of the black heroine, to say nothing of that of the black hero, must always be left at society's mercy in order to justify white history and in order to indicate the essential validity of the black condition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, it's, it's, it's interesting, um, Daphne, when you say that the obscure volume, and we'll get to this later in the, in the panel, but um, the ways in which, one of the reasons that I think it's important that we gathered today was to ask his forgiveness for having ignored him for about 20 years, from about 1968 or nine until his death, um, when he was writing, technically, I felt, um, the most adventuresome volumes of his life in terms of the essay. Um, so one of the things that we'll talk about um, towards the end of the panel is um, our forgiveness, um, his forgiving us, and our forgiveness for our limitations as readers and intellectuals when it comes to a black queer powerhouse. But we'll get to that. John. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, you're on, I think. Oh, yeah. So you mentioned, um, you know, sort of the last period of his life, and uh, one of the most important books to me, I think, the first uh, James Baldwin book that stuck in sort of in my head and it remains there, and I realize has you know, profoundly shaped everything I've written ever since is just above my head, yes. his final novel from 1979. And uh, I was joking, I had, uh, my mother had a copy, my mother had all of uh, James Baldwin's books. And um, for some reason, I was drawn to that one. And I picked it up, and it was the first book, I think, where I saw a black male uh, teenage relationship, uh, gay relationship depicted, a adult black male uh, teen uh, uh, relationship depicted, and a book in which Baldwin really, really, really pushes the limits of the novel, right? It's a yes. experimental. Um, and so anyway, so this is, this is a little section uh, from that. Okay. So the two characters here, Arthur is the, one of the central characters, and Arthur was part of a, a gospel group as a child, a young person, and Crunch was another member, of one of the older members of the group, and Arthur and Crunch uh, become lovers, right? Okay. He wondered for the first time how old Webster was. He knew the ages of Red and Peanut, but he had never seen them before either. Peanut's color glowed like peanut butter and honey, and Red's broad brown speckled face made Arthur see as though for the first time his light brown chocolate eyes. Everything hurt. The napkins and the tablecloth hurt. The black coffee, as the lady poured it, hurt. His smile when he looked up and said, thank you, ma'am, hurt. 
the sunlight relentlessly rising to send them on their way, filling the dining room, crashing in the kitchen among all the pots and pans, thundering in the voices heard from far away and yet too near of the cook and the servants. Servants? And the man scouring the pots, hurt, assaulted, began to devastate my brother. And this is being narrated by Hall, Montana, Arthur's surviving brother. And the telephone rang somewhere and someone said, excuse me a moment, and someone else said, I sure hope you boys enjoy yourselves down here. And Webster said, we better make a move. And Red rose first, and Arthur's heart shook, and then Peanut wiped his lips with the white napkin and smiled and it hurt. And someone else said, bam, bam, to Birmingham. And laughter filled the room exactly like the sunlight and it hurt. And all this time, Crunch had been seated two seats away laughing and joking and making noise, not looking at him, and yet, and Arthur knew it, entirely concentrated on him, and it hurt. That hurt, that, that yes. the pain is the pain of desire. Just a little bit more. He wanted to run, run, wanted to be with Crunch somewhere forever, wanted Crunch to take him in his arms. He did not know what he wanted. The small of his back was wet with terror. Is this my life? My life? And to compound this terror, his imagination, like a newly wiped blackboard, held nothing at all, no images at all. Gorgeous. Thank you, Paul. Um, I have two, two, two super brief um, passages to read to you. Um, when, I, when I am fortunate enough to quote unquote teach James Baldwin, which you really can't do, mostly you just have to give them the books and tell them to, do, and to, tell them to get to it. Um, um, there, there's something that I look for in, that I always recognize and look for in the text, um, and that is his it's called, it's called high queen style in my mind. And that style is a kind of reading of the situation that he's just left or that he's in, or a description, or a description of his own body in the context of um, other people. So there are two um, passages that I think are significant to that. Um, one is from his essay on Norman Mailer, The Black Boy Looks at the White Boy. And um, at the time, Norman Miller publishes uh, his book, Advertisements for Myself, um, and Baldwin writes, which presently crossed the ocean to the apartment of James Jones. Bill Styron was also in Paris at that time, and one evening, the three of us sat in Jim's living room, reading aloud in a kind of drunken, masochistic fas fascination, Norman's judgment of our personalities and our work. Actually, I came off best, I suppose. There was less about me, and it was less venomous. But the condescension infuriated me. Also, to tell the truth, my feelings were hurt. I felt that if that was the way Norman felt about me, he could have told me so. He had said that I was incapable of saying, fuck you, to the reader. My temptation was to send him a telegram which would disabuse him of that notion, <laughs> at least insofar as one reader was concerned. I have no brilliant hypothesis about that. <laughs> um, and this is, um, there, these are just a few sentences from The Fire Next Time. Um, In spite of all I said thereafter, I found no answer on the floor. Um, he's, he's had a quote-unquote conversion. Not that answer anyway, and I was on the floor all night. Over me to bring me through, the saints sang and rejected and prayed. And in the morning, when they raised me, they told me I was quote-unquote saved. Quote, unquote. Well, indeed I was in a way, for I was utterly drained and exhausted. <laughs> I mean, yes. And then this goes on to say, when he is describing his life in the church, um, he doesn't give us any other um, qualification except that it's the drama in his mind. And he says the church was very exciting. Um, it's sort of like asking, 
often when people recover from any sort of addiction, one of the things that we leave out is pleasure, right? That there is pleasure to be had in any kind of, any form of extreme um, behavior. And I think that one of the things that ties us together here is the extreme behavior of love, but also the archness mm -hmm. of standing outside of that love, a love that's denied you because of queerness or race. And I just wanted to, to, to ask our distinguished um, persons today what they felt about that passage that they read and why did it resonate for them personally, politically, or otherwise? <laughs> Do you want me yeah. to go first? <laughs> I, can, I, I can go for it. I can go first. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, that passage, Baldwin sort of, the, all the things that gather around his relationship to his face, right? Um, uh, there's, for me, um, this move, you see it in the early essays, Notes of a Native Son, just this movement in and out of like kinship and broken kinship, yes. right? Like this sort of real deep kinship with his mother, but then this kind of wounded kinship with his father's, right? His it keeps, the mother keeps getting disrupted by the, there's a, there's a, I know exactly what you mean, Stephen. There's a yeah. kind of weird inverse cock blocking that goes on between yeah. her yeah. and the mother. Yeah. yeah. I hadn't thought of it. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <right. laughs> I hadn't thought of it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, our gratitude. We're all utterly, our gratitude we're all you, utterly and drained and exhausted. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, but, 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 you know, the relationship with, with his father, by which I mean the father he writes about in Notes of a Native Son is... Who adopted him, yes. Who adopted him is so complicated. Um, and, and I think what, like, that passage about what his father had to say about his face, you know, he sort of says at a certain point... So one of the things that really... Um, I, I feel like, you know, Zora Neale Hurston talks about like ha having the moment when something falls off of the shelf inside of her mind, yes. you know, and like the moment for me with Baldwin was like, you know, I was a precocious uh, uh, a kid, but like re reading constantly, but I feel like when I started reading Baldwin's essays was the first time I understood myself to be encountering something we would call literariness, mm -hmm. right? So like in the passage that I read, he sort of says that his father, he caught his father not in a lie, but in an infirmity. Mm -hmm. And like, I was like, what does infirmity mean in that? You know, and he means it in the obscure sense of like, that argument he was making is in need of validity because That's there's right. not evidence to support that argument. And it's also a word that it's also a word that um, his idol Henry James would have used, right? Oh yeah, the, that's the true. Sort of that's the, true. Yeah, the the kind of word that's a fact and a metaphor at the same time. Right, right. But then at the end of the passage that I read, he says, you know, I discovered that my infirmity might not be my doom. My infirmity might or my infirmities might be forged into weapons and mm -hmm. so he's using the same word but in a different sense right that's right he's like saying my weakness might be forged into a weapon and so it's the complicated sense of like baldwin he's got this father he's wanting something from this father the father's fantastically cold and reticent mm -hmm. won't give him what he wants baldwin's constantly writing about this the, the desire for an inheritance of something, right? a story, something. Well, it's sort of, I mean, uh, it's fascinating because what, what I hear you saying is that he was really, what he was questioning and what he wanted more than anything was his legacy. That if you have a father who is that removed from your own person and you're also not the biological right. child, you're twice removed right. from the experience, that gives you, that gives you the space to write about it and describe it, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be loved for right. it. Right. Right? And I think, I think that Daphne's um, quotation really is about 
also what does what does it mean to be in a black couple? What does it mean to be in a family? Mm -hmm. Right? That the white actress always gets sort of rege regenerative treatment, but at the same time, we're wait the audience has to make up the black family in some right, way. Right, right, right. So I think that that's very connected to what um, Daphne was saying. Would you agree, Daphne? I would absolutely agree, Hilton. Mm. But I would also <laughs> say that, um, you know, um, his ongoing enchantment, disenchantment with um, the mythos of the white girl, the white heroine, mm. whiteness and womanhood um, yoked together, you know, are, are also a, a part of the project of his trying to figure out in the universe what his genealogy is going to be, right? That's and right. his identifications and disidentifications with these screen queens, you mm. know, is really powerful. But part of his, you know, the the what's so majestic and astonishing about Double Fine's work is that you go on a journey with him and his own meditations on his own reading practices in relation to the culture industry that's done so much violence to black folks. That's right. right. And, and also his own desires that are bound Right. I mean, I mean, one of the things that happens that readers will recall at the, at the beginning of Go Tell It on the Mountain is that he's mm -hmm. in the cinema Yes. And it's the Betty Davis movie playing, right? Yes. And he's yeah. having yeah. this experience of of covert sexuality mm -hmm. at the same time that this woman is being flashed on the mm -hmm. screen. And another thing that I wanted to say in terms of um, how Daphne and, and um, Stephen's readings um, reminded me very much of the ways in which um, I had a lot of sisters. And... Um, we would go to the movies and always, if I was watching television or we were in the movie theater, if my sister said, oh, that's my girl, you knew that it was a, a, an actress who wasn't really acting, that it was, had something to do with reality. And I think that's what he's talking about too. So yes. my sister Diana revered Susan Hayward or yes. they didn't really have time for Katharine Hepburn. And, <laughs> uh, because they were, you know, Susan Hayward was living yes. in the real world yes. of, Marginal, marginalization, yes, right? Yes. So I think that yeah. um, one of the things that he's identifying always is the metaphor that is you. Mm -hmm. What is the metaphorical thing or person that says y you exist, that yes. you are this person? Yes. And I think that's why he loves um, Betty more than any yeah, of the yes. other actresses yes. because mm -hmm. A, not only does she, is she not a standard beauty, but he says he talks about the intelligence of her forehead, mm -hmm. um, that she was radiating right. thought. Mm -hmm. my, my dear John? Yes. So I think for me, the passage, so I, first I want to say that I love that you mentioned Go Tell on the Mountain. I think that's a, a, his perfect novel. Uh, it, it was, for a long time, it was my favorite novel by him. And of course, Giovanni's Room is the, the one I think that's often acclaimed as like the gay novel, right? Mm -hmm. But just above my head to me is, you know, I realized the most important in part because of how he is trying to do so many things at once. And I think this was one of the criticisms of this book, you know, because he's dealing with, you know, the civil rights movement, he's dealing with black politics, he's dealing with, uh, you know, kind of gospel music, a gospel, this gospel music group, um, you know, from New York traveling in the South. Uh, he's dealing with, you know, sexuality in the most interesting and complex ways. I mean, if you can actually break down every relationship in this book, mm -hmm. and you know, it's, it, they're, they're queered in very interesting ways. In fact, the brother, Hall, the supposed straight brother, tells his son at the end, you know, um, you know uh, people will say your, your, uh, you know, your uncle was the F word, and uh, you know, uh, he, but he wasn't that. And then the son, he says, uh, you know, he loved uh, men, and uh, sometimes he loved women, you know, and then he, the father says, and I've mostly loved women, you know, but when I was in the army, you know, <laughs> I, you know I, I was with men, and I was just like, whoa, when I get to be reading that, it's like, wait a minute. And it's just so interesting how he's, you know, and then he ends up with the, the, the family that they're, the, the, the Montana, it's all Montana, they're competing with, um, kind of in the, this, this gospel circuit, uh, you know, he ends up with the younger brother of his chief rival. I mean, it, so it's just so fascinating to me how much is packed in here. And I realize that, you know, you could, I could spend a lifetime just yeah. unpacking this book. Yes. Um, one, of the, one of the regrets, um, of course, that I have is um, 
that John's wonderful writing is not in, in our catalog, but you will buy the catalog, right? <laughs> and um, and um, I wanted to read something from um, John's book, Punks. Um, I, I just want to say that when I read, um, I often have the experience that the person is my companion for a time. I remember Stephen Best and his lovely husband, Will, having me to the most delicious lunch in San Francisco, and we started talking about Tom Gunn, who had been a professor at Berkeley, and I was writing about it at the time, and I felt that Tom Gunn was my companion while I was in San Francisco at that time. So for me, um, Baldwin's companionship um, has meant everything to me throughout a lifetime um, because um, you can't be lonely um, existentially or otherwise if you know that somebody who has lived in loneliness has been able to create out of it. And I think um, that is what John does in this poem called The Angel of Necessity, which really speaks to me about um, the feelings that we have for Baldwin. Do you mind if I... I won't I won't butcher it. I won't butcher it. It would be an honor. The Angel of Necessity. The Angel of Necessity perched beside me on the path train. Platform smells of cigarillo, smoke, and freshly blooming lilac bushes. His smile rose along the brown river of his face like breezes on an August afternoon. See me, brother. I stare as he removes his knit cap to reveal his mane, gray thickets braided in a coat of knots I intend to ravel. I eagerly share with him the story of my fear, which I had once been trained to call love, but I can see he already knows what I am going to say. Hear me, brother. Desire. He understands me before I shudder my lips. Unburden yourself of your suffering, he says without uttering a word, the language somewhere between a lilt I have heard before and the silence that is the beginning of self-knowledge. Show me, brother. Then he turns toward me as the night burns in the train windows, laughing, spinning those braids into a bright blade I reach towards, but instead of clipping my fingertips, they extend at each joint until they bind us. We are together here, the angel of necessity, and me in this hot, tunneling air. And he is sharing something with me about life and the life inside of life, his heart under my heart, singing like the pulse that fills my ears. Feel us, brother. Though I cannot make a single word that he is saying as the train approaches the station, I am letting the truth of his story pour throughout my core, and I am listening, listening deep inside him. Thank you. Thank you. So when we say that we hear Baldwin, um, in Stephen's um, essay, which is in the book, which you will buy, <laughs> um, um, Stephen has written something quite extraordinary about um, sound and as has Daphne, um, coincidentally. Um, Stephen's quote that I'm pulling from his essay says, understatement is the name for an elusive sound that inaugurates an intensity of searching for Baldwin, that invites his approach at the price of self-scrutiny and self-exposure. To that end, it feels as if in attempting to get back to, quote, the speech I really spoke, unquote, Baldwin were turning away from the learning and sophistication he had acquired and crawling back with real purpose into the shame he felt in being called N-word. And this is an extraordinary passage, Stephen. Um, and I think that for us to understand the context in which that this occurs, um, tell me if I'm wrong, but he was writing Go Tell It on the Mountain and he started to listen to Bessie Smith records in Switzerland, mm -hmm. where he was with his nominal partner. Mm -hmm. um, and he said it, she carried him back mm -hmm. to the quote unquote picking in it that he must have been. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of one of the things that's extraordinary about your essay is that it talks about 
um, indirectly, it talks about the ways in which you really can't go ahead without having um, dealt with um, how your house is built. You don't have a house until you learn how it's built. And I think that one of the things that I loved in terms of the music of your prose was the, this idea of declarative and not declarative sentences, whispering and saying something outright. And I think that Baldwin did both things in almost every sentence, right? Yeah. That he's declarative, but at the same time, everything is rhetorical and metaphorical. Right. That he's working in two different countries simultaneously. Is that something that you were drawn to as a reader? Yeah, so I kind of, so, so what he says, what the prompt for me was this interview that Baldwin did with Studs Terkel, mm -hmm. where he sort of, Studs Terkel plays Bessie Smith for him. Right. And Baldwin says, I think, for, kind of for the first time early in his career, but he continues to say this until the very end of his career, this sense of like, I sounded like, I had to deal with the fact that I sounded more like Bessie Smith than Henry James, right? right? This sense of like, I had become this sophisticate, this worldly cosmopolite. Mm -hmm. James was my teacher. But he's always grappling with the sense of another sound. Um, and that sound is often, um, it's about Baldwin the boy. Mm -hmm. And it's about Baldwin, the, the empathetic boy that both sees, that's sort of what's beautiful about the passage that I read. He both sees something about the price his mother is paying, mm -hmm. but he also sees something about the way he's being deformed. Deformed, but also, as he says, strengthened, right? That, yeah, 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 that, yeah. The weapons, that one of the, um, one of the things that was so extraordinary um, in working on the show and reading through with you and Daphne and a bunch of other contributors was that there was this wonderful passage that I found where he says that when he was a boy, um, he would say to his mother, I'm going to become famous and I'm going to be rich and I'm going to buy you this and I'm going to buy you that. And she, and she would say, well, it's more than a notion. Mm -hmm. And he said it was his first experience of black rhetoric. She didn't say, <laughs> she didn't say yes and she didn't say, say no, no. Right, 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 <laughs> at the right, same right, time. Right, right. So I think that right. living, having feet in both camps of... of um, Allowing for, I think what part of his genius is to allow for not knowing, mm -hmm. right? Um, that the process of becoming is about not knowing at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, the poet Elizabeth Metzger in writing about Baldwin's sentences describes it as wading into wonder. Yes. The way in which his sentences wade into not knowing. Right. They don't try to resolve. Yes. They're trying to create a form. I just, I want to talk a little bit about class because I think that it's a very important um, thing that we're discussing here too is um, this is a person who's more or less self-educated right? and he's not had a university education, he's not um, had the, the gap year that people have to discover himself, but he gave himself those years and he gave himself that education and I think that the, the positive effect of a willful, willfulness can be that you see something on the horizon that's yourself. Mm -hmm. And that horizon, you're moving forward. You don't know what the ship is. You don't know what the waves are going to be, but you can see that there's a horizon. And I'm wondering if this is a, a very powerful um, question. But I wonder if the N-word aspect that he writes about was secondary in terms of the wound to the F-word. That what if we went through his text and took out the N-word whenever he says that he was wounded or hurt? And what if he's really actually saying it was the F-word um, that was the sort of more... Uh, I wouldn't say the more, but the more decisive form, mm -hmm. forming of his life. Because if you go to each of the books, 
it's almost always something about covert sexuality, sexuality that can't exist, which is to say love that can't exist. Mm -hmm. um, and he only gets to it at the end of his life where he's able to say, I had a lover at 16, I, I did these things. And it's, it's concurrent with his becoming, being taken up by Saul Leader at the new, um, the new leader, I'm sorry, Saul, I'm getting the name wrong, but the new leader, commentary and so on, that these white publications started to publish him. And at the same time, the denigration about sexuality um, is a very po powerful one. And I wonder if, as an exercise, if we took out the N word and put it with the F word, what would we find? Uh-oh, did I stop the conversation? <laughs> I think um, you also Daphne, just, you answered Daphne. the, no, I just feel like you were answering the question that you're right. asking in, beautifully, as you always do. I mean, I just keep thinking of Go Tell It on the Mountain as being, you know, a microcosm of that kind of duality, that tension between, you know, phobic injury and psychic violence and white supremacist psychic violence and, and, and the, the ways in which those two things are entangled with one another. But I feel like that would be a text to especially use as an exercise. I also think, just to go back to the previous point, not to take us away from this very important place that you've, you've had us to sit with right now, but that that's also a text that is a long meditation on, on learning and, and not knowing, right, yeah. so within, the, within a spiritual reserve. Um, that there's something liberatory about this kind of practice of the unlearning, the um, hegemony of the church, and, um, and, and opening up a new epistemology at the same time through another mm -hmm. mode of spirituality. Well, when he says um, that he knew that he was smart and that he was going to get his revenge that way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's, I think that if you... First of all, that's a word that he would love from Charles Dickens, who was a great love of his early life. Um, but this idea of being vengeful or of getting revenge for the, things, for the suffering mm -hmm. that you've undergone mm -hmm. and that you want to incur, mm -hmm. um, if you cannot be that person, it sort of goes, brings us back to wonderful, brilliant Julius Eastman, Right? The composer who composed a piece called Gay Gorilla. Mm -hmm. And he said that I hope that if gay people were under attack um, in the way that most people are in the world, that I would be a gorilla in that fight. Mm -hmm. And so to me, Baldwin's um, warfare is not only language, but it is that mm -hmm. queer voice, the archness, where that is utterly drained and exhausted. Or... Um, fuck you to Norman Mailer, or, or mm -hmm. I can't go through life like you, Norman, I don't have your shoulders, etc. Yeah, 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 yeah. um, mm -hmm. These are the ways in which we get to battle mm -hmm. um, the world that says you shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. I think also one thing I wanted to ask you guys about was the, really the, only, the kind of only central female figure in his, in his novels and essays is his mother. Mm -hmm. And does that have everything to do with belief, do you think, that she was the mm -hmm. person who didn't tell him he was wrong to, mm. to write, to exist? Mm. John, what do you think? <laughs> well, actually, I want to go back to, uh, this is a, these are excellent questions. I just want to go back to, uh, you know, this question of um, revenge and, uh, you know, his, his lyricism, right? Because there's a his, way- well, I didn't hear your last word. Uh, sorry, his lyricism. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because one of the things that I find so uh, remarkable about his work throughout, particularly is, is the fiction, if you just look at the fiction, is how he utilizes uh, lyricism in really interesting ways, right? I mean, sort of to go back to what Stephen was saying, I mean, you, you know, you, you're wading into not knowing, but he's, he has this kind of force, which I think a part comes from, you know, his sermonic practice mm -hmm. of, you know, building towards something. So you get a sense, I was saying earlier, um, of a kind of futurity. There's always a futurity there. There's always a, a you mentioned horizon, and a, a horizon. He, of course, can see his own horizon, but he's opening up a new horizon to use, uh, you know, uh, Jose Esteban uh, Munoz's term, queer, queer futurity. So, and I, so, so I, you know, I, I see there being, 
when he's grappling with the F word, right, and, and uh, homophobia um, and queer phobia, right, and we think about, I also think about his public performances, you know, it, 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 self-presentation self at the end of his life where he was wearing the scarves and he was pressing John, the limits gonna, of you're gender. Gonna, you're going to crack me up because there's <laughs> uh, Sarat Piquet did a documentary about him in, in um, Turkey. Mm -hmm. And at one point he's walking through the mosque and it's I'm great. sorry, it's a queen, right? right. Yeah. And he's walking through the, mm -hmm. and I said, it took him, he had to leave yeah. in order to walk that way, mm -hmm. in order to use these words, um, in order to theatricalize, which is to big up the self right. that would be yeah. diminished in America. Right. Yeah. But he's, I guess what I'm trying to say is that he, even early on, he is creating the possibilities. You can see how he's laying the foundation for the, that self-becoming, but it's also a self-becoming that it opens up for others who read his work, right? Who encounter right. his work. Yeah. That's right. I mean, there are, the two major figures that we're, we're talking about um, when we, we live in a world now where there's a lot of accessibility to um, queer images and the cell, but we have to remember that really there were only two writers in that period, and it was him and Truman Capote who were theatricalizing the self, so that this story is that Truman was in Midtown with a friend, and he had a long scarf, and the truck driver looked at him, and Truman said, you know, what are you looking at? I wouldn't kiss you for a dollar, <laughs> right? <laughs> and Baldwin, um, similarly in, in um, New York um, and in Paris, he says often would get into altercation. He said, I've broken enough champagne glasses at parties. So w one of the things that I find incredibly fascinating about him as a figure and nourishing um, is that bravery, um, that walk through um, those arcades in, in, in Turkey. I want to read something here um, by the estimable Daphne A. Brooks um, from her essay, In the Catalog, which you will buy. Um, Daphne says, it is like a laying on of hands. The minister in Baldwin is especially privy to what the music can do, how the holy rollers singing sisters on the street, along with their brother armed with Bibles and a tambourine led by a performer whose, quote, voice dominated, dominated the air, whose face was bright with joy, unquote. Transfiguration is subsequently afoot. I think that's a wonderful thought, um, that transfiguration and transform like transformation is um, something that is active, but it's also the presence of grace as an activity. And I think that we lost our own grace when it came to Baldwin in the 70s and 80s when the civil rights movement um, became something else. And it became black nationalism and it became homophobic um, and it became misogynistic in theory and in practice. And he was left behind by people like Eldridge Cleaver publicly attacked. Um, I want him to forgive us. I don't want to sentimentalize the fact that we have, you know, always loved Baldwin because we didn't. And it's very important for us to acknowledge how we failed our own grace vis-a-vis -vis Baldwin. So my feeling is um, that we can teach by giving young people the opportunity to see an entire career um, and to see the ways in which writing doesn't sit still. It becomes transfig transfigured and transmogrified yeah. through the spirit um, and the grace of the writer. But we also have to take responsibility for how we failed him. Um, and, and I think that's the work of being adults. So I, that's what I feel that the, your essays are, your work is about that. Well, I just want to add to that based on what John has inspired us to think about the, the ways that the sermonic dimensions and aesthetics um, of Baldwin's prose, you know, hold that kernel of futurity, again, to meditate on who's Jose, who we lost a decade ago um, this fall. But... Um, I was thinking about that again, even with Devil Finds Work 
when I was reading out loud the very last few paragraphs of the essay, which are really kind of about his formalistic commitment to something so astonishingly revelatory. It does have the power to transform you as a reader, but it also kind of, it brings home and also transforms the initial vision of the piece or what you presume the piece is. So I just want to reiterate what a gift it is to think about the transformative powers of his work um, and the ways that we can continue to imagine that we can transform ourselves in this broken world. Yes, yeah. and that, um, and that you know, the, one of the primary points for me um, at, at the wonderful David Zwerner Gallery and elsewhere is that um, I wanted him to have his body back mm. and that, um, that we had broken it in elevating him, we had drained it of blood and not let him have a queer self again. Mm -hmm. So I think that the work you guys are doing um, not only gives him um, that queer self back, but it also gives him, um, gives us pause and mm -hmm. also uh, inspiration for how, no matter how broken we are, we can put ourselves back together enough to make a bridge to other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they're telling me I have to stop, so. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the meaningful and dynamic discussion of James Baldwin's deep legacy in literature. Let's hear it again for them. Of course, since we are an art museum, we must also reckon with how visual artists have inherited Baldwin's prolific body of work. It is my pleasure to now welcome the participants of our final conversation, God Made My Face, visual artist on James Baldwin. <laughs> Thelma Golden is the director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem, the world's leading institution devoted to visual art by artists of African descent. Under her leadership, the Studio Museum has gained renown as a global leader in the exhibition of contemporary art and a cultural anchor in the Harlem community. Golden is a recognized authority on contemporary art by artists of African descent and an active lecturer and panelist. She also serves on the board of directors for the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Barack Obama Foundation, the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Okay. Okay. Garrett Bradley is an American artist and Academy Award nominated filmmaker whose work spans narrative, documentary, and experimental modes of filmmaking. Her debut documentary feature, Time, earned her the Best Director Award in the U.S. Documentary Competition category at Sundance Film Festival, making her the first black woman in the history of the festival to win this award. Bradley received her BA in religion from Smith College and her MFA from UCLA UCLA's School of Theater, Film, and Television. Bradley's forthcoming publication, Devotion, will be the first in a series of research-led publications on artists by MIT Press and Listen Gallery, and it will be released in early 2024, so look out for that. Bradley lives and works in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thank you for being here with us. Glenn Ligon is an artist living and working in New York. Throughout his career, Ligon has pursued an incisive exploration of American history, literature, and society across bodies of work that build critically on the legacy of modern painting and conceptual art. He earned his BA, pardon. Select curatorial product, projects include Grief and Grievance, New Museum, New York, Blue Black, Pulitzer Arts Foundation, St. Louis, Missouri, 
and Glenn Ligon, Encounters and Collisions, Nottingham Contemporary and Tate Liverpool, England. Ligon's work has been shown in major international exhibitions, including the Venice Biennale, Berlin Biennale, Istanbul Biennial, and Documenta 11. Last but not least, Candace Williams is a visual artist whose practice spans collage, sculpture, film, performance, writing, publishing, and curating. She explores and deconstructs critical theory around race, nationalism, authority, and eroticism. Her work examines the body as a site of experience while drawing upon her background in dramaturgy to envision spaces that accommodate the varied biopolitical e economies which inform how form and movement are read. Williams establishes indexes that network parts of the anatomy, regions of black diaspora, as well as communication and obfuscation, relaying how popular culture and myth are interconnected. The artist is also the founder and editor at large of Cassandra Press. <laughs> An artist-run publishing and educational platform producing lo-fi printed matter for classrooms, projects, artist books, and exhibitions. The platform's intention is to disseminate ideas, distribute new language, and propagate dialogue centering ethics, aesthetics, femme-driven activism, and black scholarship. Please give a warm Brooklyn welcome. Thank you, Margot, and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Margo, for that introduction. I'd like to thank my colleague and friend Ann Pasternak and the entire team here at the Brooklyn Museum for having us, Darren Walker and the entire team at the Ford Foundation. And I want you all to join me and all of us in saluting that first incredible panel, Stephen, <laughs> Daphne, John. And I really want to thank Hilton. I want to thank Hilton for the incredible volume that brings us here today, which you will buy. I, but also really want to sort of take this moment and really salute the exhibition um, that Hilton made, um, God Made My Face at David Werner Gallery, because what it did, I mean, as he describes, is give Baldwin back his body and his queer self, but it also was one of the most radical and daring curatorial exercises I had ever seen. And I still stand in awe of the way in which Hilton created this collective portrait with art, through art, with artists, and about artists. So I want to applaud Hilton for that <laughs> sort of incredible intellectual act. So as Margo said, it makes all the sense in the world to think about Baldwin through this sense of visual artists and the visual, and I could not be more pleased to be here to moderate this conversation with these three incredible artists. Um, as many people know, I've been a curator all my life, went to college knowing um, I wanted to be a curator, and had the great fortune of interning at the Studio Museum when I was in college. So I understood that my commitment to curatorial practice was also going to be a commitment to black artists. But in many ways, um, that was sort of sealed in purpose for me uh, by the fact that I was a student of James Baldwin's when I was in college. And Alexa Birdsong is here today, and we are part of that group of young people who had the chance to study with him um, at the end of his life. And in that moment, as he taught us how to read, and in all of the ways, um, one of the things that he did for me was that he gave me Buford Delaney. He made me know that there was a legacy that needed to be tended, specifically for Buford, but more broadly for visual artists. So it feels very special to be here today to speak to these visual artists about their work and about Baldwin and what he means um, to them and what he can mean for our understanding um, of the visual. So we're going to begin with each of these artists uh, showing us a work of art that they will introduce and then we will see, and then we'll move to the conversation. So we'll begin with Garrett Bradley. Thank you. Thank you, Thelma, and Glenn, and Candace. It's such an honor to be in this space with you all, and to each of you that are here, and to Hilton. Um, this is a really special 
moment, you know, there's, there's things happening inside, there's things happening outside, there's things happening all over the world. And, um, you know, it's always really nice to come together and be able to have really candid, open conversations. And um, so anyway, I, I'm going to show a clip. I'm going to actually not talk too, too much about it at first. Yeah, it's called Safe. It's an excerpt. It's a part of a um, trilogy, uh, multi-channel work. And so this is about three minutes. And I'm going to, I think I, okay. Y'all do that? Okay. Well, first, let me uh, thank the first panel for generating such amazing ideas to respond to and uh, providing the context in which we three would speak. And particularly to thank Hilton, uh, I've been in a number of curatorial projects that he's done. And each one, I think, I was thinking about this, like, you know, as an artist that's been engaged with Baldwin's work for a long time, um, I don't think I really understood some things about what I was doing until I was into, into a show that Hilton had curated because suddenly I was dialogue, in dialogue with a lot of other artists who were thinking about Baldwin in similar ways or different, very different ways. But also I think Hilton was providing 
you know, like a good curator, a framework for me to think about my own work differently. And there was something that was said in the last panel that was kind of amazing. Um, Stephen Best talking about Baldwin talking about his father, and I think I'm going to get it a little bit wrong, but I was talking about lies and infirmity, maybe that was the word. And Hilton was saying, oh, um, what's wonderful about Baldwin is he uses words that can be both facts and metaphors. And I was thinking about that in relationship to my work that you're seeing behind me, which is a series of paintings called Stranger Paintings, Full Text, and they use the entire text of James Baldwin's 1953 essay, Stranger in the Village. And when Hilton said facts and metaphors, I was thinking, oh, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> It only took me 30 years to figure out that's what I was doing. But in, the fact of the essay is there. It's the entire text of the essay. But it is rendered in oil paint and coal dust, which is this sort of shiny black gravel that's left over from waste processing. Um, and that material was really an important addition to the work when I first started making it. Let me see. Um, because it's, it literally is the leftover from waste, wa it's a waste product from coal processing. And I was thinking about when I was first engaged with Baldwin's work, that I wanted to use the text of his, use his words, inhabit them in some ways by making paintings using the words. Um, but they had to have the gravity, the weight, the density of Baldwin's words. And I was looking for a material that maybe that could be added to oil paint, because oil paint didn't seem sufficient somehow, and found this coal dust. Somebody said, oh, use coal dust. And I was like, what is that? And I found it, and I realized, like, oh, it's perfect because it's from the margins. And so much of Baldwin's work is about thinking of bringing the margin to the center, elevating something that's been overlooked, the disesteemed you know, is one of his words. He's talking about the, the rage of the disesteemed. And was thinking about bringing that material into the space of painting. Um, let me see. Another one in that series, Black on Black. Um, and thinking about also, you know, Baldwin's essay, Strange in the Village, he's it's 53, he's in Switzerland, he's in this little Swiss village. He says for many of the villagers, he's the first black person they've ever seen. He's dealing with what it means to be a stranger in that particular context, but also a stranger to Western culture. Um, he's in the essay dealing with questions about Europe's relationship to its colonies and former colonies in Africa. He's thinking about his relationship as an exile from America to the civil rights movement, to his blackness in America versus his blackness in this Swiss village. And the essay is 12 pages maybe, but panoramic in scope. And so it took me, as I said, many, many years to get to the place where I could tackle the entire essay, but also the painting is not the essay. The essay is in the book. It's perfectly legible. It's not legible in my painting as such. And I was thinking about that as a way to kind of acknowledge that Baldwin, you can't know all of Baldwin, and that, that makes him such a good writer, because we can sit here and dis discover him, you know? Many, 50 years, 70 years after an essay is written, it still has this sort of resonance and unfolding. Um, so I wanted the paintings also to be that. So they're not legible in a straightforward way, but I think the difficulty that they stage is the difficulty of knowing anything, of dealing with any subject matter, the struggle to, to find meaning, to make meaning. So that's all. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Candice, and yeah, th I'm super honored. Um, start off with thanks. It's always amazing to be 
in Thelma's presence and Glenn, longtime fan of your work. And this thank you so much to Hilton also for always being a, a volume <laughs> uh, in my own mind and thinking. Um, yeah, so I, I started this press called Cassandra. Uh, we're actually upstairs also in the Copy Machines Manifestos show. So if you get a chance to go check out the Copy Machines show, um, Drew Sawyer um, curated and Brandon, oh, I'm gonna forget his last name, which is bad, but uh, it's on the wall. You should go <laughs> and see it. It's a really beautifully curated show <laughs> um, with a lot of, a lot of really um, great work in it. So uh, I chose to start off with Cassandra, um, just a Cassandra slide, because I also make collages and performances, but Cassandra has taken up a lot of time in the last like seven years and has been really, um, the labor of love, I think, coming out of the studio in the last few years. Uh, and Cassandra's kind of chief mission is to think about how to fuse, how we can fuse ethics and aesthetics and questions around aesthetics, politicality, and especially, I think, um, have, it's been shaped by a longstanding, perf um, a longstanding kind of like interest and background that I have in theater and dance and performance and especially black performance. And um, yeah, right now, and especially in light of Baldwin, I'm really, I'm reminded of a Tony Cade Bumbara quote that a friend also actually put into my, into my mind or into my mouth now. Uh, so shout out to Benji for, for this. But um, Tony Cade said that as an artist from an oppressed group, it's our job to make the revolution irresistible. Uh, and I think definitely in honor of Baldwin, like the work that Cassandra has been doing for so long and for, um, hopefully we'll be doing for longer is really to sort of think about our shared public space and the knowledges and the kinds of knowledge, the knowledge stewardship and the um, exclusionary practices that produce uh, the public and what pu and many publics in, the, in our shared, um, shared spaces. So I'm thinking about scholarship, black scholarship, um, the nature of being sort of like hyper-commercialized, fetishized, and simultaneously excluded. Um, that goes into um, that goes into the nature of just being sort of black and in public space. So uh, Cassandra makes readers. I make privately in my studio performance work. Um, I won't talk too much about the performance work, but it's also sort of dealing with, um, especially the fictions of otherness. So political fictions, affective fi fictions, uh, and then where the political and the poetic sort of stand still or stand together where they fall apart, how they're weaponized um, or mobilized, let's say, for uh, political space. So in this work, I've been thinking a lot about especially the, the black feminine, and I have to shout out Hilton again for the women, because it's been pivotal to this work. Um, and then this is a work I've been making for like 10 years. I probably won't stop making about uh, the myth of Eurydice, and especially the black masculine and, and how much that rage of disesteem, of the disesteem, but also that space between life and death and the forces of life and death go so much into the processes of black aesthetic and black creative energies. Uh, I just thought I'd put that up there since it's confusing. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I, I think we can just keep, we can maybe start the conversation from there since it's, the rest is like a mini reader on Baldwin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So what I've asked each of our panelists to do is to share um, their Baldwin origin story. And so we're going to start with Candace. Yeah, uh, Baldwin started a lot in school. Actually, I went on a foreign, I went to Cooper Union, so I did a foreign exchange at Cooper, um, to, and I chose to go to France to sort of follow in Baldwin's footsteps. And yeah, I think it started with Stranger in the Village, uh, this idea of maybe moving Mm, to use a Terry Francis term, melancholy migrations. So sort of coming from Baltimore, from Trinidad to Baltimore to New York, and then seeing, you know, trying to restate, retrace other people's scholarship or other people's explorations of their own blackness throughout the diaspora and follow Baldwin to Paris. Glenn. Um, I think it started probably in uh, high school. I had a professor who had an after-school reading group uh, and it was outside of the school, so it was at his house and he lived on Christopher Street 
and uh, bleaker. And so, and I lived in the South Bronx. So <laughs> that was quite a transition. Um, but on the way home from the reading group, um, I would wander around the village, uh, 14, 15, 16 years old. And I remember very distinctly A Street Bookstore, um, seeing in the window of A Street Bookstore uh, a James Baldwin book. Um, and I think it was the edition that Hilton showed in the images here, um, Fire Next Time with his picture on the cover, which would have been you know, a vintage print, a, vi a vintage book at that time. This is a, oh God, I'm dating myself, but um, mm -hmm. 77, yeah. mm -hmm. 78, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but being struck by the image of Baldwin on the cover, but also being struck by, oh, let's see, that cover was uh, Notes of a Native Son, mm -hmm. but also thinking about Fire Next Time, which I think was next to, the, to that book, uh, next to the um, book that Hilton showed, and thinking about the relationship between text and image, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but also thinking about Baldwin on that cover and, and what it must have meant to readers to see a black author's face on the cover of a book at that moment when it was first published. So that was my introduction. But also I think in college, more, more in-depth reading of Baldwin, mostly of the essays rather than the novels. Um, and I think it is the novels that have had a more profound influence on me, though listening to the last panel, I, read, I realize I've read very little, actually. Um, so there are many things I have to sort of go back to. I'm gonna ask you about that, about the novels, but first, Gary, your origin story. Yeah, I think my, my first experience was in high school uh, with Go Tell It on the Mountain. And it's funny, because I don't know how you guys feel, but when you learn things in school, um, I mean, great teachers allow you, I think, to understand things beyond a curriculum or beyond one dimension. But, um, you know, I think I was, you know, also you're in high school, so there's that dimension that you just are existing in. <laughs> and I think as I've gotten older, actually, I've been more drawn to his essays. And I think that uh, YouTube and social media and the internet um, has brought this this sort of other way of engaging with Baldwin, which I know is also discussed a bit in the catalog, which you guys will buy. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm excited to think about that a little bit more, but I will say just quickly, I think what did cement itself in me in ways that I probably couldn't articulate similar to you, Glenn, around like coming to a realization about something down the line is his, um, like on Go, Go Tell It to the Mountain, it was like, he's looking out at things. It's very much about looking at things and this play on reflection and mirror and the sort of dark canals that one goes through in, in self-awakening. And I think that that's definitely has operated for me in a lot of different ways, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So from those origins, all that clearly, you know, had an impact in that moment. You know, Baldwin has come into all of your work in different ways. Can you speak specifically right, about a way in which, through your practice, you've encountered, engaged, thought through Baldwin in, in any way? Garrett, I'll start. Yeah, I, um, well, I think he, and I don't know where I read this, and this is also one of these things where it's like, you have these tidbits of things that he's saying, and then they, and that's a whole other thing of like, how do we not mythologize, or I had this conversation the other day around, I think, something that, you know, this person was talking actually to Hilton about like, how do we not just mythologize Baldwin, but how do we really see him as a, as a full being? Um, and I think part of that goes back to his own kind of language, which was that questions, you know, result in answers, but that those answers are actually just new questions. And, and if we understand that, we understand that the, that the new questions and the new answers are going to constantly change based on geography, based on um, time, based on new generations that are coming. It's this endless, endless cycle, it never ends. And I think my work has always been, I've always really started with conversation. I've always been 
you know, I'll have a problem or something will come to me, a question, a sound, whatever. And my instinct always is to go to other people and to bring them together and say, what do y'all think about this? And then those, that conversation is what creates this third thing that's outside of myself and them, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Bald Baldwin literally sits at the center of so much of your work, and it was a thrill to see, of course, those new, newer of your works where you take on the whole essay, Stranger in the Village. But I know that Baldwin has had a profound effect throughout your practice. Can you talk about that? Well, I think, you know, in some ways to, to take someone's words and make work out of it the way that I've done is about inhabiting a role model in some mm. ways. It's mm -hmm. about using Baldwin as a kind of substitute self, you know, to express things that maybe I didn't feel like I could express in other kinds of ways or definitely not express as eloquently, <laughs> as grandly, as profoundly as Baldwin could. And so, you know, very early on, you know, I was very interested in abstract expressionism. That was the kind of work I was making. But I came to a point where I realized I needed a different kind of content in the work, that the content I was generating by making these abstract expressionist, fourth generation abstract expressionist paintings weren't, didn't, they didn't have enough, they didn't say enough. And the solution I found to that issue was to bring the writings of people like Baldwin or Zora Neale Hurston or Ellison, Gertrude Stein, whatever, into the work directly. So I was, in a way, inhabiting their words in order to express things that I wanted to express, to say things I wanted to say. So it's, he's always provided this way in to certain kinds of ideas in the work. Um, but at the same time, you know, Hilton was mentioning how in the 70s, 80s, there was a kind of, uh, you know, Baldwin fell out of favor, which seems impossible now mm -hmm. because he's everywhere. But there was, a, and that's kind of the moment I became interested in him. That's the moment when I was thinking most about the essays. That's the moment when I was trying to think through how to introduce text into my work. And so that's the moment when Baldwin becomes super important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess also because my work is so much about this question of you know, oscillation between invisibility, invisibility, legibility, illegibility, that Baldwin going in and out of focus in the society was part of that, you know? Um, but I think sometimes the moment to look at something very closely is the moment where it seems furthest away and out of focus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gantis. I actually have some more slides. No. <laughs> so I think one of the greatest ways that, because Baldwin, as we talked a little bit about, is like our black cultural inheritance. You know, like we, as I think, or any black person, um, black peoples kind of facing any public uh, in general have to confront Baldwin and the proliferation of images uh, that come out of his writing, come out of his practice, come out of even, I'm struck by the agent, uh, the, I don't know what they're called, headshots for the photos like because even his headshots for random you know not a lot of people's author photos are so iconic um, so yeah thinking about the mythology that he provides in terms of what it means to be a black and like not just a black um, artist but a black intellectual and like how much that intellectualism is like a part of the media that surrounds Baldwin's mythology. So this is like images, I mean images, slides, video from the Buckley debates from 65, I think are still super relevant to black pedagogists. Um, definitely thinking about how he takes, you know, not just like political topics, but how he takes especially radical and very hard to talk about political topics um, from the work through fiction back into political reality and is responding in real time to so many different kinds of black political organization, whether it's like grassroots or even more commercial forms of black, um, black liberation. Uh, and then really importantly to think about his connections to so many other thinkers and radical, um, just expressions of ra black radical thought um, from political to entertainment. Uh, I think thinking beyond even, so how Baldwin becomes a commercial form or a com almost a commercial actor, a public actor, 
um, his style, his flair, his flamboyance, uh, his, he becomes almost a diplomat in so many ways, as many, as many of our black entertainment kind of political class does. He becomes a diplomat um, to the black radical tradition for many others. And I think even in, it's really interesting and I have so many questions, I think I'll probably be annoying to you both later, but uh, I have a lot of questions about this and what Hilton said earlier about this um, forgiveness of him in the 80s. And, uh, and one, the last slide is, is specifically of two moments where I think Baldwin interacts with black radical feminism in ways that I think are especially extremely potent to today and to conversations that are having today around gender essentialism, queerness, the intervention that queerness is on like the black church, on a lot of means of black social organization that aren't necessarily anti-imperial and that do hold still a lot of space of misogynoir, anti-blackness, and how we come, how we kind of like gauge our own critical voices inside of our communities. And I always look to Baldwin for that courage, um, the courage to really say like, we do have our senses of privacy and that those senses of privacy are hyper nuanced uh, and that we are both public and private. I think he carries in this way that is really important and like, um, yeah, and even as a celebrity, he becomes a kind of text uh, that I think sadly does sometimes obscure his, actual, obscure his actual text in writing, but that I think also entombs it in this legacy that makes it such a, I mean, we can't, you know, we can't deny his importance in so many different forms, like whether it's from paintings, the Buford Delaney painting to these, you know, clips on social media now, I think, especially with the war in Palestine, he's someone who's always courageously talking about the interdependence of all of our liberation and I think he does that, you know, he, by showing up in what looked like Oakleys and just always the best glasses, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, are you wearing Oakleys in this, like, is this, this is the 60s. What is he wearing? <laughs> That's wild. Um, but yeah, just showing up, being fabulous, but also, you know, taking the writing and not being afraid to take the writing outside of fiction and back again and not being afraid to be in dialogue and not mm -hmm. like in this um, National Press Club speech, he actually says, it's, he's, he's asked about the color purple and he says, I thought it was awful, right? And he, he takes it the step further to say that this is a critique of Steven Spielberg, not of Alice Walker. Mm -hmm. And that's important, right? Like to keep thinking, to keep bringing those conversations about our interiority um, along for the ride through however black figures are weaponized in public discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I was deeply inspired too by the, the idea of fact and metaphor. And so, Glenn, you spoke a bit about engaging the novels. And I do want to sort of create some space here to sort of think about the space in which, right, Baldwin, the novelist, right, was imagining Right? imagining worlds. Now again, as we know from Hilton's writing so much, he speaks about you know, Baldwin being so supremely autobiographical, but if we step into the novels, what we see are the sort of representations of many worlds. So Glenn, can you talk about what compelled you about the novels? Well, I think actually I'm, I'm a bit of an outlier here because I think the essays for me have always been the stronger writing for me, that I'm less engaged with the novels. Um, though I think, you know, I, I think it was Henry Louis Gates Jr. was talking about uh, Giovanni's room and imagining, you know, sort of like the fact of that inhabitation of those characters. I mean, that's what novelists do, they inherit characters. It, you know, inhabit them, mm -hmm. inherit them, inhabit them. But I think the idea that at that moment a mm -hmm. black queer person is writing this novel, you know, Giovanni's Room, which imagines these white characters was seen as revolutionary, you know, mm -hmm. somehow out of his lane. Um, but I think that Baldwin as a novelist uh, definitely was always out of his lane in some ways. And it was interesting to hear John Keane talk about, you know, uh, the later novels and their experimentation. And that's mm -hmm. something I want to dive into more, mm -hmm. think about more. Yeah. Well, when we were preparing for this, of course, you know, I was saying how much I want to see more of those novels on the screen. Um, and 
even said to our fantastic sister director here, right, that, you know, I am deeply waiting for, you know, a film adaptation of another country. But, Garrett, can you talk about you know, sort of this, the, the notion of the cinematic, right? We, we, we all look at the ways in which Baldwin's language in the novels and the essays, right, contain these multitudes, right? They sort of p prose, but sort of deeply embedded with poetry, but also, for me, incredibly visual. Can you talk a little bit about that relationship to the cinematic, and then also the way in which his image exists in that form? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, I've read a little bit about his process in writing the screenplay for the Malcolm X film that Spike ultimately ended up doing, and I think that being a relatively frustrating process for him, which I can completely relate to, and it brings into this question of like, why, why, why is, what is it about, as, especially as a, as a writer, like Baldwin, what was that? And I have a feeling it had something to do with this sort of enforced form and structure and the way in which uh, language had to be confined, the way in which the images and, and the worlds that he was creating with his words had to be confined. And it, that brought me to think a little bit about how, you know, when you're reading his work, yes, it's very image oriented, but actually it's eliciting a feeling. And it works the same way that I think music does, where I think I've always thought of music as being, I mean, I hate to say this, but like kind of the highest art form because it is kind of because, I mean, <laughs> I, I think it, I mean, and when I say highest, I mean that. I should say maybe universal in a certain kind of way because it allows it allows people I think to um, insert themselves in a certain kind of way, um, and you are creating your own movies and it brings you to this other place um, that that you're really in control of in a certain kind of way and it just it made me think about how feeling what does it mean as a filmmaker to be operating from a place of feeling and to not be relying in a certain kind of way on, um, on that same kind of structure. I'm sort of giving you this roundabout answer. Um, and I think that the, the other thing that I'm thinking about is when I, when I think about Baldwin, at the image of Baldwin, especially in social media and on YouTube and how that's entering into this new generation of understanding his work, um, I'm reminded of another thing he wrote in one of his essays that talks about how every art, and I wish I could quote it as beautifully, of course, as he wrote it, but that every artist comes into, into the world feeling as though their era or their generation is there to stifle them creatively, to, to stop them, to prevent them from fully realizing their own artistry and who they are. And that part of the job of the artist is essentially to harness that and to, um, to make oneself and one's work important, regardless of what anybody says or does. And so on one hand, it, Baldwin's image, yes, it's, it's paving paths, it's, it's, um, it's allowing all of us to see ourselves in those same spaces, but it's also operating in a way that says that one has to do this. It's not just that you can, you actually have to in order to exist in the world. Thank you. Candace, your work has been animated by the archive, right? And, and uh, thinking about what it means to create meaning from what's left from the past. Can you maybe imagine for us, right, when we think about the sort of archival implication of Baldwin, what, what does that mean to you? Well, I think it's super, um, super potent question. Um, I'm still stuck on him in, in the, the cinematic prism, which is another Terry Francis just wrote a book on Josephine Baker called Josephine's Cinematic Prism and definitely thinking about Baldwin's cinematic prism. He's almost like, someone mentioned Dickens also, but it feels like, because I know D.W. Griffith used a lot of Dickens to think about how to even start organizing camera, mm -hmm. and Baldwin feels like, for so many black directors, almost like he's like our Dickens in a weird way. It's like how villains come in stage right or exit stage left. It's almost like his, his writing, his like, does that feel real? <laughs> His writing like, kind of feels like it almost like predicts black contemporary cinema in a way. Like just the, I think about another country all the time too, as almost like a tic-tac-toe board, you know, where it's like, these are the affective regimes that make up mm -hmm. cinema space anyway, you know? And, um, and he's really like cued into that. But with, with Baldwin in the archive, um, 
everything. I mean, there's no, it's strange how much, I think doing dramaturgy, um, especially doing dramaturgy for black dancers and black performance artists, um, black culture workers, Baldwin is like one of those voices in all of our heads, you know, like where we actually, I can even probably, I don't do, you know, good whatever voices or improv, yeah. but I could probably do, you know what I mean? Right. He has this kind of like mm -hmm. almost like this mid-Atlantic, he's like, I hear him and I hear Hitchcock and I hear, I hear this kind of like canon. Um, and in that, I think that means that he's, he's gonna have a hand in so many. And I think because of the different kinds of media that he took it upon himself to really understand the importance of showing up for mm -hmm. and showing up in, like he's hugely important to the, to the archive. I think about this term that uh, Adolf Reed suggested in a, um, an essay called The Trouble with Uplift where he says the black chattering class is kind of like the, almost like the, the, uh, the chief expression of our libidinal economy in the state, in the states especially, but globally is this, is what poor, how poor black people talk to each other, right? Those are the, those are the weird kind of crevices and fears and spaces of doubt and anxiety that like propaganda show up to negate somehow. And I think in those crevices, we can anticipate that Baldwin has said something. <laughs> you know, like in all of those kind of spaces of cultural theater, mm -hmm. he's gonna be there, you know? Um, and I, and I, I love the range of the writing for that too. Like we, the essays to the more like, to the very, very intimate fictions and how he sort of takes them through the public's, you know, so many public theaters that's, I think he'll be, um, he's essential to the archive and I think he's essential to I always, I always wish, especially with people like Baldwin, that we had more access even archivally, you know, mm -hmm. because that mytho the mythologies that are around, and this is a question of public domain, like what we, what we can access, right? What isn't hidden behind paywalls or hidden inside of institutional vaults or, you know, untouchable to the general public. Um, I think there are, there are just so many gems in terms of like what happens behind the scenes and those networks and those collaborations and those students, uh, like finding out you were a student, super exciting. Um, yeah, so I feel like there's, there's ways where like people and figures like, like uh, Baldwin still need excavation mm -hmm. and still need a lot of like archeology span around them to really figure out how deep that impact is. Um, but I also feel like he, he, in a way, sort of like is even the remnants that we remnants that we have of these extremely iconicized moments. Um, yeah, in a way, I think they spearhead a lot of how Black people think about themselves showing up as intellectuals, whether it be on like Instagram or in their own private mm -hmm. forms of commercialization or in their brands and their songs and their protest chants. You know, so I feel like he's gonna show up in the archive in so many ways because he provokes the archive mm -hmm. to like keep looking at itself as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think what you're positing is his, you know, almost essential space, right, in the late 20th century to think about anything that comes after, right? So that's again the cultural inheritance as an intellectual, but also, um, you know, as a person. And again, part of what the exhibition did was to imagine more fully him through a queer lens. And I'm wondering, Glenn, if indeed when you began using the work, if that was one of the ways in which that you were claiming um, Baldwin's work, story, history, and contextualizing it through your practice. Yeah, I, that's an interesting question because I think, um, you know, the irony of Stranger in the Village is he doesn't name right. that. He says, I'm staying at the chalet of a friend, but he doesn't name that friend as a quasi-lover, lover, whatever he was to him. So there is a sort of gap in that essay around his sexuality that's, that is very apparent in his being and very apparent in other forms, like Giovanni's room. Um, so, I'm forgetting what your question was. Queerness, <laughs> queerness and Baldwin. Um, one of the things I was thinking about in Hilton's show that was quite amazing to me was there was a recording of Baldwin singing a spiritual. And I, I guess I knew Baldwin, of course he sang, but I'd, I'd never heard it. 
and I'd never thought about it. You know, I'd never thought about, and Hilton was talking about, you know, bringing back Baldwin's body. Well, part of that was his voice. Mm -hmm. And his voice is very iconic, as you said. It's everywhere. We hear it in our heads. But not his singing voice. And not that tradition that he's tapped into when he's singing. And that was a real revelation to me in that show. It's a little moment. It was literally like there was a record player. You put on that record, and it was Baldwin singing. Um, but a beautiful kind of something for me to think about, you know, in terms of, because I'd used his words over and over again, but I hadn't thought about his voice in that kind of particular way. Um, so some more things for me to delve into. And, and I want to ask you another question, Glenn, which mm. is because you have used those words, Stranger in the Village particularly, so much, right? It's a through line through your career. How has your reading of that work changed over the years that it has been part of your practice? Well, I guess there are two, a couple of ways. One is that if you think you know a text, you think you know it. <laughs> and so in a way it becomes the ground on which other things happen. You know, so in some ways now, it is the ground on which the paintings are made rather than what the paintings are about or made of in some ways. Um, but in another way, I think what's been interesting is to think about Baldwin in the last, say, 10 years with things like I Am Not Your Negro and his, his kind of resurgence, you know, um, Thinking about how other people have interpreted that work has been really informative to me. I'm thinking of Teju Cole, who wrote a beautiful essay about 10 years ago where he goes to the little Swiss village that Baldwin's in and tries to think about, you know, what does it mean to be, you know, Nigerian American going to that space rather than African American, um, but what how the culture has changed, or or even to think about in that space what Baldwin got wrong about Africa. Baldwin's vision of Africa is quite deficient in some ways, and Teju calls that out, you know, even as he's very admiring of the sensibility, the words themselves, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's thinking about Baldwin through the lens of other people thinking about Baldwin, which is one of the things I, again, to say Hilton's show did a lot for me in that respect. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you all, um, you know, if you might consider for us what you think Baldwin had to say specifically to and for visual artists. <laughs> well, I think first it does go back to this idea of you have to take your work seriously. You have to create space for yourself. I think that that is number one, but there's also just sort of, um, it's funny, I'm thinking about, I'm just listening to both of you, and I, I'm, I'm reminded too, of, I think that in the essays and also in his talks, there's um, a thorough line of him switching the words I to you, mm -hmm. which I, I, I think is really powerful and certainly goes back to the church and goes back to his upbringing. But this idea of, um, asserting one's very intimate and personal experience onto the collective mm -hmm. and allowing that to be a space of empowerment is profound and it also is activating, it goes into the future because, and, and so, so does this notion of, again, I think questions and answers, it assumes that because this never ends, it will go into the future and um, and that's something that, uh, yeah, I, I just lost my train of thought because I was just, in the zone with something. Um, but I think, you know, I think, I think also just going back quickly, again, around the, the idea of mythologizing and the idea of these, I think my own insecurity around, wow, I'm, there are these, these quotes or very specific things that I remember that he says, and does that take away from him and his totality? Um, and so I think that it's our job um, and I think it's something that he would, I would, I would hope, I, th I think, that he would also sort of entrust us with, which is to always continue to question and to always, um, to always take the work and bring it to the next place. And I think that's what artists do. Otherwise, things like, they're not meant to stay still. You know, quotes, people, 
eras are not meant to be confined in however they were captured in that moment. They're meant to be reused, you know, um, just as the archive is constantly. Um, I'm just thinking about this portrait yeah. behind us, uh, Buford Delaney's portrait of Baldwin. He'd made many portraits of Baldwin throughout his lifetime. Uh, the earliest one probably is the Dark Messenger. Is that the title? I think so. Of it? Dark Rapture. Dark, Dark Rapture, which is a great title. Um, behind you. 41. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I'm not going to remember specifically what Baldwin says, but I know he's written beautiful essays around Delaney's work. Um, but thinking about Delaney as a f an older figure for Baldwin, who sort of takes him in and shows him what, what it means to look at something very, very closely. That's what Baldwin got from Delaney. And he writes about that, that you know, learning from Delaney how to look very closely at something. But also I think what's interesting about Baldwin's relationship to Delaney is that later in Delaney's life, Baldwin became his caretaker, you know, physically, financially, emotionally. And that back and forth between Baldwin the writer and Delaney the painter, I think was a really beautiful model of a kind of artistic friendship, black queer friendship you know, that span generation, that span genres of making. Um, so quite inspired by that relation, that particular relationship. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you're right. It's beautiful because there's a familial dynamic, right? And when we understand his relationship to his father, right, which we heard some of, you know, it makes the relationship to Delaney feel even more profound, right? In the way in which, you know, Baldwin sort of protected, cared for him, but again, as my experience, um, you know, has given me as this gift, wanted to make sure his legacy also then would continue to be protected. Candace. Yeah, I feel like what Baldwin would say to the two visual artists, or like for a visual artist, does. As you. I mean, I feel like with with something Hilton said about his high queenness comes to mind. Like I feel like I feel like I hear the scream. Like I feel like he would be like, "Don't look at me." <laughs> I feel like he would be like, "What do you have to say?" I don't know. I think I, I feel calls for courage would probably be insisted upon. It calls for nuance. Calls for um, especially like I think something he was very unaware of was the line between propaganda and creative fiction and the recuperative power of kind of like fiction in community. And um, yeah, and I think he would, I think he would call us to be aware of, aware of how we're consumed. Um, yeah, oh, and probably like many more queenly, <laughs> queenly proverbs. <laughs> yes, love, yeah. definitely love. Right, like I think that's the, that's also the whole thing. It's like the, the the I to the U is also saying, and I think is evident in all of his work that he is. We're all connected. That you can't separate the self from the collective, and vice versa. Um, I think that's, uh, and I mean, it can sound kind of abstract, like what is love? But I think that the more, and I think his work was constantly in this really. In this way, he was always rediscovering himself. And that rediscovery was in parallel or maybe in response to a discovery of the world, you know? And I think that is what we do as artists in a certain kind of way, whether it's overtly about the self or not, you know? Mm -hmm. And that idea of an artist, you know, he sort of occupied a role that now we'd call a public intellectual, but it seems in the way in which he enacted it, right, was far more complex than the kind of performative idea of, you know, a, a pundit. And it seems to me what it offers um, in so many ways is a vision of what an artist can and should be. And I'm wondering if any of you have a reaction to that, right? Like, what, what does that mean to you? I'll let you go. I have a hot take. I'm, I'm curious what y'all would think too, because I just saw the, the um, Hunger Games movie and just thinking about like sci-fi and Octavia Butler especially and like the complexities of just, yeah, black fiction writers especially taking from the political to create 
their fictions, Baldwin hovering between autobiography, fiction. Um, yeah, it's interesting to think about like, like strategies and especially strategies for being in public and for being a part of public discourse and how they change with the spectacle of the public, of the representation of the intellectual. So I'm kind of curious with like how we are understanding the Baldwin myth today and, and really understanding how, how, yeah, the disassociation, I think someone also mentioned Munoz, like what is it to be disidentifying with the caricatures that were hyper prevalent in media, you know, before modernity, before black people were making images, making, before we were visual authors, <laughs> really? And like that kind of intensity, I mean, especially for you, Thelma, as a curator, like how are you understanding like the complexities of, of celebrity uh, as a source of engagement or a kind of engagement with black discourse and with black political thought? Yeah, no. And it's evolution, I guess. You know. Yeah, can't, you know, huge question. And that's why, again, I take so much from what it means to think about Baldwin broadly. And I was gonna say a figure like Baldwin, but I, 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 I see him in a very unique uh, category. And I think that what it means is the past gives us an example for the future. You know, where I wanted to end was on futurity, right? Because I do think Baldwin's work is so concerned with that, that he exists within this imagining of a future, right? When we understand the ways in which he understood himself as a young person, right? He was imagining a future, the way in which the vo both literal travel around the world, but also how you know he grew in his own sense of his self was about a future. And this moment, right, is a future that he created. So I think when I think about that, I don't have a specific answer to your question, but where I go for those answers quite often are the example, right, the legacy, the cultural legacy, the intellectual legacy um, that Baldwin provides. But I'm wondering if either of you sort of think about this idea or have a well, way Well, I was thinking about um, in the earlier, uh, the panel before us, someone mentioned, maybe it was Hilton mentioned uh, Sadat Paquet's documentary, uh, Baldwin on his life in Istanbul. And um, I mean, it's kind of hilarious because it has these scenes where, you know, Baldwin's in bed and he wakes up and he's in his underwear and he gets dressed. And I thought, okay, <laughs> you know, that was unnecessary, but fascinating. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, um, but in that documentary, you know, you can see American warships in the distance and Baldwin says, uh, again, I'm not going to be able to quote it exactly, but he says, you know, you never get away from American power. You know, there it is off in the distance, but it's easier to see from a distance, you know, from another country, from another place, which another country becomes the, like, I think it's, that's the title of, uh, or from another place is the title of the documentary. So this sort of sense of like, sometimes you can see things clearer when you're away from them is something that I'm really interested in. And I don't feel like I've enacted that enough in my life, you know, that um, our, our dear friend, curator, departed O'Queen Wazer says, you know, like America is, you know, like we think that our problems are the world's problems and they're not, <laughs> you know, that we think that our, experience is central and it's not. And I think Baldwin was tapped into that very early, mm -hmm. that he had to have a global sense of how to be in the world rather than an American sense of how to be in the world. Yeah, just, well, just thinking, gosh, there's so many things I'm thinking about, but both of you all just said, just like Battle of Algiers, I'm thinking about immediately comes to mind and Baldwin, you know, living in France, I believe when, when that was happening, um, anyway, that's a side note, but just the, your, uh, Candace, what you mentioned around like audience and the public and celebrity, um, brought me to think about Baldwin's distinction between audience and public and that public was almost like this fleeting thing. The public was almost aesthetic and superficial and more about, um, a quick observation, whereas audience was a relationship that was ongoing and that was built on trust. Um, 
And so I'm not sure where to go from there, except to also say, as we all know, that you know, as black people, we've always made images, whether people see them or not. Um, and whether they're celebrated or not, or put in a certain canon or not, we've, we've always been there and we will always be here. Um, so I don't know, there's this interesting, I think our relationship to, well, I'm gonna just go off for one second in this other place, just because I, and I don't know how to connect the dots, maybe, maybe we can all figure out how to do this, but um, you know, I'm just thinking in this moment around uh, censorship and around, as artists, the idea of um, the question of, um, well, if Baldwin said, you know, that the world, our problems in America are a fabric, uh, then the solution, obviously, to our problems can't be solved with one, um, in one pursuit, right? That we have to tackle a lot of different things from different angles. Um, and what happens when we start to remove ourselves as artists, right? And I think Baldwin wrote about this as well in times of war, you know, the role of, of the writer as being, as being the truth speaker. And so maybe it's more of a query than, a, than an actual connected thought around, you know, if, if one pursuit or one idea is to remove oneself, and I should be more specific, I'm thinking also about just the, in the film industry, you know, at IDFA, at, at, uh, in Amsterdam at the film festival this past month, there were a lot of filmmakers that were pulling their films from the festivals, and it presented a really important question of what happens when artists of all different types start to remove themselves from a conversation. My fear is that we end up in a space where there's only one voice, which is the very voice that we're trying to resist. But that isn't to say that that alone is wrong. It just means that it needs to be coupled and in parallel with other things that are happening. Um, and so, I don't know, I think that everything we're saying is what brought me to get into this soapbox, maybe. But um, it's a beautiful thing, and Baldwin brought us here to think about all of this, you know? Right. And I think what brought us, you know, very broadly is this idea of a collective portrait, right? The way that we all individually can see and understand him and the way in which the many publics, the many audiences have engaged that. So I think that's also just a question of reading, mm -hmm. right? And like and and the question between audience and public, I think is also me, maybe even further collapsing. Mm -hmm. Like if Baldwin is a is a was a future seer, let's say, right? Like it's like it's even further collapsing that that and his position also and his, his, his archive kind of also further collapses that distinction between a public and an audience in terms of who's able to read with him and who's looking at him, watching him read, right? Who's understanding what, how, that he can read, you know what I mean? We have all these kinds of levels of appreciation of him as well and that I think, you know, it's, it's interesting to bring the issue of public and audience uh, or his distinctions between public and audience up because I was thinking about that a lot. In, in terms of what we understand to be the public domain, you know? Mm -hmm. um, like the shared knowledge and the shared epistems and the shared ontologies that we can all easily reference are very, are strong libidinal forces, but very weak social ties, right? Like we can all reference white supremacy, we can all reference so many forms of social domination, so many forms of social coercion and control. Um, but then we have these kinds of distinctions in audience, like who can read? And that's what, what performance is really interesting for too, is like the social scripts that develop around who can't speak, this is all necropolitics, like who, whose death is prolonged, right? Through stages of acceptance, um, complicity, violence, rejection, like, and so there's all these scripts, I think, that, and that makes Baldwin also super interesting to read right now, because his audiences also collapse and fall under who understands his political, um, I feel like that, like, a, it's an ethic, right? Like, who understands the ethics of his political assertions that liberation should be forefronted over, like, all identities, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. In our last moments, um, I would love each of you um, as visual artists, as visual makers, to consider perhaps, right, thinking about a future, what you don't know about Baldwin that you want to know. Now I'm asking this because all three of you are deeply invested in research-based practices, but also in creating works of art, right, that open out for us often the possibility of more and new and different questions. And that again is a space in which we all continue to learn from Baldwin, which is that sense of looking at the world broadly and asking the question. So what about Baldwin do you want to know? What, what, 
what path through a future with Baldwin's work oh, so resonates for days. all of you. Um, I mean, yeah, shout out to Darius Carter and Anya Wallace for the class they taught for Cassandra called Black Air Or. Um, and their, their class, they looked at, at the relationship between writers and especially black writers and their editors. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be where my questions, the bulk of my questions lie for like, I want to know everything about his relationship to his editors and those, those intimacies and those non-intimacies. And yeah, I would love to know more about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. That's amazing, actually. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just got chills thinking about editing Baldwin. <laughs> you know? and Who edited Baldwin? Because those manuscripts <laughs> must mm -hmm. exist somewhere. Mm -hmm. I just have never seen them, mm -hmm. but they must exist in some archive. Or well, some of them are in the papers, which are held by the New York Public Library and the Schomburg Center Schomburg. for Research in Black Culture okay. in Harlem. <laughs> Let me just say that. <laughs> I know, okay. but okay. go ahead. Okay, well then, I'm schooled. <laughs> well, I want, I want more of that then, you know, because I'm very interested now, and in, I'm working on a project that's about annotations and things, and I'm really interested in that kind of commentary on a text. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to dive more into that mm -hmm. as a possibility of thinking about, not only for the research, but also thinking about that for work, my own work, yeah. Yeah, I would, um, it's funny, I was, uh, I'm working on something right now with uh, Carla Holloway, who's a professor, she was a professor at Duke University and an author, and she um, wrote a book called Passed On, and she and I were talking about Baldwin yesterday, and she said, you know, I always think about his relationship to resurrection. Um, and to art, and I was in so much of her text is about this idea of art being um, a reflection of grief. Um, uh, she poses the question of, you know, is art uh, one way to sort of uh, appease or to, to be a salve to grief? Um, and so I think my question to Baldwin would be, is that true? <laughs> does he does he feel that that's true? And and also. Does it does it actually make it go away? Like if grief, because grief is more of like a neighbor. It's like something we learn to live with, next to us. Um, and so maybe is there this other thing that we're not considering around um, the purpose of grief? Does grief have a role much bigger than what we think it is? You know, in some way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know that this audience, um, along with me, wants to thank you all, not just for the words today, but because the visual is a potent way for us often to engage and think through these ideas and thoughts. And adding to what now has become this effort to, co to create this collective portrait, your voices are added here to our thinking about, our understanding of, our reverence for James Baldwin and his legacy, but also for the future. Right, that he's sort of already written that we are inhabiting. So thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Candace. Thank you, Thelma, for moderating such an incredible conversation. Thank you to all the writers, to all the artists, to all the scholars who started off our symposium with such generous reflections on Baldwin. Thank you for being here and for bringing your attention and your presence into this space. We are now going to break and clear the theater for a reception next door in the Beaux-Arts Court where the new publication, God Made My Face, a collective portrait of James Baldwin will be available for purchase alongside an open bar and music by DJ Sabine Blazin. So please get a drink, get a book, we hope you'll hang out with us for a bit. For those of you who have tickets to the performance later tonight, we'll be opening house around 6.45 for the Gospel of James Baldwin with Michelle and Dick Thank you, and we'll see you soon. Take care.